What's that? I have to be looking at that last comment. Oh. <laughs> wow. All right. Happy Shabbaton. Happy Shabbaton. Happy, happy day of shouting. Yay! <laughs> the is coming. Yay! That's all I got today. <laughs> now, um, I was uh, asked to revisit this concept here of uh, the sound into all the earth uh, regarding this day. Uh, what does the scripture say about it uh, versus what uh, tradition um, has been piled upon it over the years? Um, I want to be asking, what is this day of trumpets according to the scriptures? All right. Uh, there's a tendency of approaching the festivals from a, a, a linear fashion in its prophetic layout. Uh, and what I mean is that um, people see the quote-unquote spring feast as his first coming, fulfilled in his first coming, and that the quote-unquote fall feast will be fulfilled in his second coming. And the reason I say quote-unquote spring and fall is because biblically speaking, there's only two seasons, and that's summer and winter. In the festivals of Leviticus 23, fall within the summer, biblical summer, okay? Um, what's generally said with these is that Passover is Christ's sacrifice. Yes, you know, behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. Uh, that the Feast of Unleavens is putting sin out or being released from bondage to, to um, sin. That Pentecost was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which we saw happen in Acts chapter 2. Uh, that trumpets this day is a picture of the return of Christ and the first resurrection of the saints, those that are his. That on the Day of Atonement, that it's a picture of Satan being bound um, into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. And that the Feast of Tabernacles pictures the millennial reign of Christ and the saints on earth. And at the last great day, meaning the eighth day, Shemini Atzeretz, the eighth day of, uh, from the start of the Tabernacles, pictures the second resurrection and the great white throne judgment spoken about in the book of Revelation. Now, um, I know this is widespread teaching, not only limited to the, the Church of God, of, you know, like worldwide and all the offshoots. Um, it's also within various Protestant. Uh, generally, you find books on the feast. They're generally going to hold to some form that's very similar to this. Um, and when I first came into feast keeping, I accepted. And... But it wasn't until I started digging in to say that there's, I find some issues with some of these interpretations. Uh, and I find them to be more of personal interpretation than, uh, you know, more of a private interpretation instead of a uh, biblical line upon line interpretation. I remember like uh, looking at like tabernacles, for instance, and like reading books, reading the booklets, went through various Church of God booklets to see how to come up with the idea that matches the millennium. And essentially, if you look through these things, you, you might see they say, oh, Zechariah 14, or, or they might make allusions to scriptures, but they don't really say what the scriptures are saying, and they don't really make a case for it representing the millennium. All right. <clears throat> uh, for those who have feasted with us for years, this you know the position that I hold to. I don't. Uh, I agree, yes, Passover is Christ's sacrifice. As I said, John said, behold, the Lamb of God. Uh, Paul, in his 1 Corinthians letter, chapter 5, says Christ is our Passover sacrifice for us. Unleavens, yes, putting out sin. It's being released from bondage uh, to sin. He gives us a new heart and a new spirit. Uh, the Pentecost, yes, the spirit is outpoured. I agree. But I don't think that's the only um, picture of Pentecost. Um, as far as the quote-unquote fall holy days, I think they detoured off the Bible road 
and went on to the personal road and came up with their own interpretations that are not biblical. Um, I don't agree that trumpets matches the first resurrection or that Satan is one of the goats and that Satan is bound in, yes, Satan is bound. The scripture does say that, but I don't find that ties with the Day of Atonement. Okay, so don't misunderstand. I'm not saying Satan's not bound. I agree Satan's bound. That's biblical. But to tie that with the Day of Atonement, I don't find that in the scripture. I find it in the booklet, but not in the book. Okay. Um, tabernacles, again, I, I don't find it being a millennial reign. I find several examples, both biblically um, uh, in the Hebrew scriptures and in the Greek scriptures of the New Testament, um, the way that Peter and Paul both understood it, they refer tabernacles as the time of being in this flesh, not the millennial period. And Moses says it refers to the time when the children are in the wilderness, which is what we're in now. We're not, we're waiting to enter the promised land, right? Uh, last great day, I, I find is not about the second resurrection either, but it's a, a time coming out of the flesh. It's about the resurrection, just not the second resurrection. I find it's a picture of the first resurrection. I understand it in this sense. A Passover is Christ's sacrifice, unleavened putting out sin, being released from bondage to sin. Pentecost typifies the first resurrection because it's the harvest of the first fruits of the wheat. Much like we understand that unleavened bread, during unleavened bread, we have the first fruits day, which is elevation sheaf day or wave sheaf day. And that pictured the resurrection of Christ, he's the first fruits of the barley, and then the next festival is the harvest of the first fruits of the wheat uh, in Exodus 34, for example, and that's a picture of the first resurrection. I'm not going to belabor that right now because today isn't Pentecost, um, but so understand this is this is a. Uh, how I'm understanding the scriptures and these things. And if you have a differing point, it's okay. You're still my brother or sister in Messiah. We can still walk this path together. Uh, just hear these things out, study these things, prayerfully consider them all. I find trumpets here is uh, not about the return of Christ. It's not about the resurrection. Um, it's, it's a call to... Repentance, it's about, the, it's about the gospel, and uh, we'll get a little bit into that. I find atonement is about the sacrifice of Christ, just like Passover is about the sacrifice of Christ. It's about our being made at one through the body of Christ. And the two goats represent, both of them represent Jesus, one in his death, one in his resurrection. Um, tabernacles is our time in the wilderness. As I said, Leviticus 23, 43 says uh, you uh, you stay in booths uh, for seven days because your fathers dwelt in booths when I brought them out of Egypt. So it depicts the time in the wilderness. And then the last great day, uh, as I said, tabernacles of uh, Peter and Paul is both about this time in the flesh, the, the tent of this body. that uh, I put off this, my tabernacle, Peter says. Um, and so you dwell in booths seven days, the eighth day you're out of it. Uh, so it's coming out of the flesh, it's another picture of our resurrection. And essentially, what we have is camera one, camera two. It's not linear, as it is just giving two pictures of the same thing. Um, we have our call to repentance through trumpets, but we have our sacrifice of Christ through the Passover and through atonement. We have progressive sanctification, uh, where we're released from bondage and we're to put off sin through unleavened bread and tabernacles in our time in the wilderness while we're here. And that for Pentecost, we have the picture of the first resurrection as well as the last great day is a picture of that first resurrection. Uh, I know this is quite different from uh, what's presented from most Church of, most church of God and, and Messianic Hebrew roots, Protestant and all that, but this is what I'm finding here in the scriptures. All right. Um, so, what is this day of trumpets and how we go about seeing this here in the scriptures? I ran across this article on the Haaretz um, website some years ago, saying, uh, talking about the festival that they generally call Rosh Hashanah or the, the day of trumpets. 
And he says the, it says, the Bible does not list any special practices for the holiday beyond blowing trumpets and sacrificing some animals, all right? And if you spent any time searching what it says about the day of trumpets, you will find that this is basically true. Uh, that does not list any special practices for the holiday. It, here's what you do on this day. It's a memorial blowing trumpets or of shouting, depending you know, on the terminology. And here's the sacrifices you make out of the book of Numbers. Um, there's really not a whole lot of instruction. No specific reason is given for the blowing of the trumpets, nor are we told what we're supposed to remember. All right? And I'll look at that text a little bit um, in here. All right. Uh, in Europe, during the High Middle Ages, the consumption of honey evolved into eating challah and fruit, which today has become almost universally apples dipped in honey. So traditionally, the Jews on what they call Rosh Hashanah, they eat apples dipped in honey for sweetness. Uh, and again, that's changed. It was, in the Middle Ages, it was uh, challah and fruit, which has become apples and honey. Uh, the new tradition of eating pomegranates on Rosh Hashanah arose about that same time of the High Middle Ages based on a false belief that the number of seeds in a pomegranate is 613, the same as the number of Jewish commandments. Okay, Again, the, the number of 613 of Torah laws is a rabbinic interpretation of Torah. Um, tashlik, which is emptying one's pockets into the sea, or a river, or when these aren't accessible into a well, on Rosh Hashanah is first mentioned in the 15th century and is now a common tradition among observant Jews. It's supposed to symbolize the clearing of oneself of sin. Okay, So a lot of times people come in to keep in the feast and they try to look and understand, we know what's the liturgy, what's the thing, what do I do this day? How do I do this? And they often look to the Jews and, and pick up these traditions, and I'm letting you know these traditions aren't really that aged. Uh, they are within the last uh, couple hundred years. All right. So, as I said, they, they will refer to this as Rosh Hashanah. Okay. Rosh is the Hebrew word for head. Ha, the, shana, year, head of the year. Um, biblically, this is not the case. Uh, the Encyclopedia Judaica, uh, which the Jewish Encyclopedia, uh, under article on Rosh Hashanah, says it's the Jewish New Year, the autumn festival celebrated on the first and second days of Tishri. Tishri is the, what the name that they take from Babylon of the seventh month, which just began today. Uh, in the Bible, this is their comment, in the Bible, the name Rosh Hashanah, as it is used in the Bible, is only used one place, this is Ezekiel 40, verse 1, simply means the beginning of the year and does not designate the festival. So when Ezekiel 40 is talking, it's not talking about the first day of Tishri, it's talking about the beginning of the year, which is in the spring, right? The months of the year were counted from the spring month, Exodus 12, 2, later called by the Babylonian name Nisan. The month known by the Babylonian uh, name Tishri is therefore called the seventh month in the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch means the five, the five books, so the five books of Moses, the Torah. When the festival on the first of this month is recorded, it is referred to as the festival of the seventh month, and a day of memorial proclaimed with the blast of horns, or a day of blowing the horn. This is Leviticus 20, 23, 23, 25, and Numbers 29, 1 to 6. In the Bible, the festival lasts one day only, just the first day, not the first and second. But the two-day festival arose out of the difficulty of determining when the new moon actually appeared. Okay? And this is because diaspora. They don't know what's necessarily happening in the land. And so within the land, they would only celebrate a one-day holiday, but outside the land they did two because they just wanted to cover their bases in case they missed the crescent moon. Okay. 
<clears throat> now, the liturgy of the holiday, back to the Haaretz article. The liturgy of the holiday, that is, the prayers added to the regular daily prayer prescribed during this rabbinic age, deals with three main themes. The kingship of God, which is borrowed from the Babylonian Akidu, Akidu, where the kingship of the king was a major theme. So the Babylonian Akidu is the Babylonian New Year festival of the fall. And so they say that theme was borrowed from the Babylonian, the pagan festival of the Babylonians regarding the kingship. And then um, a recital of great God's great deeds and the blowing of a musical instrument. At least the latter two were taken from the Bible. So the recital of God's great deeds and the blowing of a musical instrument are biblical with this day. Um, the concept of this is about the kingship of God. That, that was something they pulled from the Babylonian Akidu festival. Because that's another uh, point people use to say this is about the, the now the kingship of, of Yeshua, of Jesus coming back as king. Um, but that was not necessarily what's uh, taught within the scripture. Another one often uh, tied in is sounding the shofar. And um, let's see if I have this in order or if I'm missing something here. Okay, many erroneously associate nearly any mention of trumpets in scripture with this feast day. Okay. Um, because of our English translations, we see trumpet, and that's why they often will tie this to the resurrection, to the return of Christ, because we see he comes at the last trump, he comes with the trumpet of God, the, the angel sound of trump, there's the seven trumps of earth, and so every, oh, trump, trump, oh, feast of trumpets, it must tie in. <laughs> but that's not how you study the Bible, right? Um, that's, that's not how it works. All right. Um, and then there'll be some issues even with translations because they'll take tradition and use it to colorize their translations. For example, the God's Word translation says, on the first day of the seventh month, hold a worship festival. It will be a memorial day, a holy assembly announced by the blowing of ram's horns. And the word for ram's horns is not in that text. So there's something that they've added to the text uh, because they're allowing tradition to colorize their translation, right? Um, I've searched the scriptures in every use of shofar, and I have not found any biblical connection between the shofar and this day. Uh, I find the shofar connected with Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, but I do not find it connected with Yom Teruah, with this day. All right. Uh, back to the Har Aretz article. It says, regarding that musical instrument, technically the Bible doesn't say what exactly is to be blown. Okay. Regarding specifically this festival, yes, but in another sense that this is the first day of the month, we know that they blew with the silver trumpets, which we'll get into in Numbers 10. Okay. Um, it is the Mishnah that first tells us this should be a shofar, a horn, usually of a ram, though it could be alternatively come from an antelope or an other horned beast. Okay, now I've told you before what the Mishnah is. The Mishnah is a commentary from the rabbis upon the Torah. It's the rabbis discussing this is what Moses meant here, this is what Moses meant here, and kind of their debates. And that the Mishnah makes up the first part of the Talmud. Okay, the Mishnah is from like 200 BC to 200 AD, and that's when it was collated and became what it is. And then the second part of the Talmud is the Gemara, which is a commentary upon the commentary on the Torah, uh, which was done by 500 AD. So, as I say, well before the Talmud was redacted in 500 AD CE, a variety of traditions regarding exactly how and when the shofar was to be blown, arose in different Jewish communities. Not knowing which was correct, 
the rabbis decided that all the different traditions should be incorporated. So on Rosh Hashanah, we have the Takiyah, which is a long blow, the Shevarim, three consecutive blows, and the Teruah, nine fast blasts separated into three groups of three. Well, it's kind of funny. They don't know which one when it's called Yom Teruah. I don't know which one of these three we're supposed to do. Let's just do them all. All blown in different sequences at different stages of the day, these added up to 90 blasts, which were then rounded up to 100. Blown today. We're almost at 100. Let's just do 100. Yeah. So here's a bunch of things we see that it's not. Or a bunch of things that are tied with it that are not the day of Trump is or not biblical. Okay. What we have in the scriptures, there's only a couple of places in Torah that talk about this day. Numbers 29, verse 1 says, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a holy convocation. You should do no servile work. It is a day of blowing the trumpets unto you. And if you notice, the trumpets is italicized. And if you're using a King James Bible following along here, you'll see that's how it is in your King James Bible. This is what I'm quoting from here. And the reason that is italicized is because the King James translators, when they would insert words that are not supported by the Greek or Hebrew text directly, they would try to insert words for clarification. They would italicize those words to identify for the readers that there is no Hebrew or Greek behind those words. So the words, the trumpets, are not in the verse in the Hebrew. It is, it's a day of blowing, or whatever that word is meaning, okay? Because the words, it's a day, yom, of blowing, tarua. It is yom tarua. So the trumpets is not there in the Hebrew. Now, Teruah, uh, Hebrew 86.43, from the Hebrew 73.21, it strongly identifies it, as, identifies it as clamor or an acclamation of joy or a battle cry. Yes! <laughs> yeah! Especially clangor of trumpets as an alarm. And what, what's an alarm? I have it down there below from uh, Noah Webster. It's a warning or an alarm, especially a call to arms. Okay. Um, and then there's different ways translated in the King James as alarm, blowing, joy, jubilee, loud noise, rejoicing, shouting, high, joyful sound, sounding. Okay. Uh, its root is rua, te rua, its root is rua. It's meaning to mar especially by breaking, figuratively to split your ears with sound, like shout um, for alarm or joy. Okay. In Greek, because uh, remember the Hebrew scriptures were translated in the Greek circa 250 BC uh, by the Jews, and they put their scriptures in Greek, generally known as the Septuagint. There's also other versions uh, of the Greek that were created by the Jews back then. And in there, uh, as well as uh, New Testament, we're talking about trumpet. The, the word here is um, 4536, perhaps from 4535, from the idea of quavering or reverberation. So it's a trumpet. Uh, and the possible root is salos, a vibration. or So it, it's like a billow or it's translated wave. Okay. So it's very much like the Hebrew counterpart of something that mars or breaks. It's caused a great vibration as it's coming out. It's a, it's a loud sound, hence the word shouting or a trumpet. Uh, generally, a trumpet is nothing you really play quietly, you know. So some other translations I looked at to see how things were done here. Uh, we have... In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you should have holy convocation. You should do no servile work. It is a day of warning to you. Or here, I actually, I was taking some of the, trans thing, um, the concepts and put them in here. It's a day of warning, or it's a day of joyful shouting, because that's the, the meaning of it. It's a warning or joyful shouting. And I find, you know what? That fits both sides of the gospel, right? Because the gospel is both a warning, 
repent for the day is at hand and it's a day of joyful shouting because we have a covering through our atonement of our Lord Jesus Christ All right Trua is often used in the context of war, and I'm not going to go through all these scriptures. Um, I did cut out a whole lot of uh, slides out of this today. I had over 100, so I, I brought it down. Um, I, when I've presented on this before, I, I did do it with that full amount. So, um, But the slides are going to be available on the download uh, if you go on our site. or I don't, Does the download put up with YouTube too, or is it just directly on our site? Okay, so you can download the slides and catch these later if you're not catching them right now. I know it's a, a lot to write down uh, in this juncture. Uh, but it's good for just doing a word study to go in and see how is Torah used contextually in the scripture? What is its meaning within scripture? Okay, so I find it in the context of war. I find it in the context of joy. Like um, Job 8.21, he says, Till he fills your mouth with laughing and your lips with rejoicing. And that word rejoicing is terua. And so this is like one of those doublets I talk about where it says the same thing two different ways. Fill your mouth with laughing, your lips with terua. So terua here is equated with laughing. Okay. Job 33, 23, he shall pray unto God and he will be favorable unto him. He shall see his face with terua. So he will render under man his righteousness. Hallelujah. That's that's some that's some joy, right? Uh, but I do see Terua when they encountered the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, remember when um, the Philistines had taken the Ark, and all that. Um, in First Samuel four five to six, when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, Terua. So the earth rang again. So this is how it's echoing out, is what it's saying. So this Teruah is something that's loud to bring back an echo. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the Teruah, they said, what means the name, the noise of this Teruah in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood the ark of the Lord was coming to the camp. Second Samuel 6.15, uh, David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with Teruah and with the sound of the trumpet. See, so here's a separate thing. There's a trumpet making a sound, and there's terula happening. So terula doesn't necessarily require there to be an instrument involved. All right? So sometimes you'll see uh, this called the day of shouting because terula doesn't necessarily require an instrument. It doesn't, it's more the act of making a sound than it is the instrument itself. So when we call it the day of trumpets, it's not fully accurate because the word trumpet is not used there. But it's something that makes sound, whether a voice or an instrument. First Chronicles 15, 28, thus all Israel brought up the ark of the co covenant of the Lord with teruah and with, the, and with the sound of the coronet and with trumpets and with cymbals, making a noise with psalteries and harps. <laughs> uh, Teruah is used with praise. Um, Ezra 3, 11 to 13, they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord because he is good. His mercy endures forever. Ki halam hasdo. Uh, toward Israel. And all the people shouted, they ruad, with a great shout, Teruah. And when, uh, when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid, but many of the priests and Levites and chiefs of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house, when the foundation of the house was laid before their eyes, they wept with a loud voice, and many teruahed aloud for joy, so that the people could not discern between the noise of the teruah of joy and the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people, to, uh, they ruined with a teruah, and the noise was heard afar off. So again, that this teruah is a loud sound. And in this case, we're finding it uh, with joy. With, with pr they praised him, and they did it with joy. 
Psalm 27, 6, Now um, uh, my head shall be lifted up above my enemies round about me, therefore I will offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of Teruah. I will sing, yea, I will sing the praises unto Yehovah, unto the Lord. So here's a sacrifice of Teruah. It's a sacrifice of joy, joyful praises to him, and they're being cried out to him exuberantly. Psalm 33, 3, sing unto him a new song, play skillfully with a teruah, with a loud noise. That, that's probably a pretty good translation right there. All right. <clears throat> Psalm 155, praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high-sounding cymbals, teruah, the high-sounding teruah cymbals. Okay. It's also used, tied in with an oath in 2 Chronicles 15, uh, 14, they swore unto the Lord with a loud voice and with teruah and with trumpets and with the coronets. So as they took their oath, they did it with a loud voice, with teruah, with trumpets and with coronets. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, aside from number 29, the other case that we have for uh, this festival out of Torah is in Leviticus 23, uh, 24 and 25 says, Speak to the children of Israel in the same in the seventh month, in the first day of the month, you shall have a Shabbaton. I know our King James has Sabbath. The Hebrew word is Shabbaton. It's a uh, different type of day with different types of restrictions. Um, and it says it's a memorial of blowing of trumpets. Notice again, of trumpets is um, italicized. I know I italicized Shabbaton, but that's just me italicizing it just to emphasize the Hebrew word different. In this case of, of trumpets, it's because they're not in the Hebrew. It's a memorial of blowing, a holy convocation. You should do no servile work therein, but should offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So this is a day of no servile work as opposed to no manner of work like a Sabbath day, a Shabbat day. So this is a memorial, zikron taruah, a memorial of blowing. Zikron Teruah. So we have Memorial Day here in America. We have do this in memory of me that we do once a year with Jesus, a memorial. So what is trumpets a memorial of? Right? The word remembrance is the, the Hebrew word zikron. It's a Memento or mem uh, memorable thing or day or memorable writing. Its primitive root is zakar, um, meaning to mark or to rem remember or by implication to mention. Um, and as I've pointed out in times past, you are familiar with zakar through, say, John the Baptist's father. What's his name? Zachariah. That's Zachariah remembered of Yah. So, <clears throat> Zakar, or Zikron Tarua, is another name, or another way that this festival is described. So it's a Yom Tarua, it's a Zikron Tarua. All right. Uh, again, from the Greek, that word that's, trans or that's Zikron in the Hebrew, in the Greek, it, this, it means a reminder, or memorandum, i.e. a record, or its root is to exercise memory, to recollect, uh, to rehearse, to make mention. Okay. So the Greek, again, is a, sounds like a good translation from the Hebrew because it reflects the same uh, definitions as the Hebrew does of zikron and zakar. So what is this a remembrance of? Right, but this is a remembrance of. We know from other festivals in Leviticus 23, for example, or uh, Exodus. What do you mean by this service? Remember that phrase? We generally read it all, uh, once a year when we come into getting ready for the Passover festival. Exodus 12, 26 to 27. It shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, what mean you by this service? You know, why are you guys... At, at this point in the Mosaic Covenant, why are you guys sacrificing a lamb and, and roasting it, and why are we eating this and doing this thing? What is this about? 
Then you say it's a sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. He passed over our houses of the children of Israel when he smote the Egyptians, delivered our houses. This is what you tell them when they ask, what is this law? Why do we do this? What's this mean? What's this signify? What are we remembering? Well, it's just, this is a remembrance of the Lord delivering us. Exodus 23, 15, you shall keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Why? Because in it, you came out of Egypt. Oh, so we're doing this to remind that we came out of Egypt. This is what we're, okay. <laughs> Leviticus 23, 40, uh, 42 to 43, you shall dwell in booths seven days. All that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths. Why? That your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. Hey, what do you mean by this? Why are we dwelling in booths, Dad? Well, because you need to know that our fathers dwelt in booths when the Lord brought them into Egypt, when they were in the wilderness. This is what it's about. Oh, okay. Exodus 20, 8 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day. By the way, remember, Zikron. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Why? Because in six days the Lord made earth and uh, heaven and earth and the sea and all is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So why do you keep the Sabbath? Because the Lord, he tells he works six days and rested the seventh. He tells us to work six days and rest the seventh. That's why. Oh. Deuteronomy 5.15. Remember that you were a servant in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from thence through a mighty hand and by outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commands you to keep the Sabbath day. So Sabbath has two explanations of why to keep it. What do you mean by these stones? Remember in Joshua? In Joshua uh, 4, 5 to 7, Joshua, uh, they, they came up now to are at the land. This is now after 40 years in the wilderness. They're ready to come in. And this is now they're going to have their own Red Sea experience, except it's at the Jordan instead of the Red Sea. And the water's going to split for them. And they're to come in and pick up stones and bring stones into the land and put stones in the water. So he says, Pass before the ark of the Lord your God in the midst of the Jordan. Take up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. So 12. And that this may be a sign unto you that when your children ask their fathers in the time to come, what do you mean by these stones? Then you'll tell them, the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be a zikaron unto you. But what do these stones mean? Well, they're a memorial of when he cut off the river Jordan and we passed over dry shot. So what do you mean by this service? Speak to the children of Israel, say in the seventh month, in the first day of the month, you should have a Shabbaton, a, a memorial of blowing, a zikron teruah. Don't do any work in it. It's a holy convocation. Make an offering. What does it mean? It doesn't say. It doesn't say. Two explanations for the Sabbath, but not a single one for this day. Right? Is it a memorial of creation? Job says, or God says to Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if you have understanding. Who has laid the measures thereof, if you know? Who has stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fashioned? Who laid the corner there, cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Oh, they teruid. Oh, is that evidence? Is it a memorial of creation? Well, don't forget that the year begins in the spring. This month is the beginning of months. Um, now, does this necess, is this one hundred percent binding that the that the earth was created in the spring? Not necessarily, but chances are that they appears to be a spring. Is it a memorial of these? Is it Joshua six, the destruction of Jericho? Because, or is it, interesting thing with the destruction of Jericho, it reminds me of in, uh, in Revelation. The seventh angel sounded, there's great voices in heaven saying, the kings of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Because here they came to the kingdoms of the world, of, the, of that land, and the, they sounded, and the kingdoms of that world became the kingdoms of the Lord 
and of his people. So I, I definitely see a connection here or an allusion back to what happened at Jericho in uh, Revelation 11. All right. Is it a memorial of these? Is it uh, Judges 7 with uh, Gideon's 300? Because that was an interesting thing. Remember they were there and they had the horns and they had their jars of clay with fire inside and they busted the jars of clay and the lights all lit up and they sounded their horns. That sounds like a picture of resurrection. You know, like the jars of clay bust and now it's glory comes out and it's at the sound of a trumpet. Sounds resurrection. Wow. Maybe, maybe, maybe they're right that this day pictures the resurrection. Wait, this is, is that even though about this day? What is this talking about? All right? Is it a memorial of Exodus 19, the law at Sinai? Because remember the sound that waxed louder and louder and made the people quake and shake is the mountain quaked from the sound that waxed there, that the great Teruah that was happening there at Mount Sinai. Well, the reality is, is that the destruction of Jericho happened at the time of Passover. Because remember, Joshua 5 was just when they just came into the land and had the Passover. Joshua 6 is right on the heels of that, and there appears to be no um, time skip or gap happening there. Gideon's 300 also appears to be possibly the time of the Passover, because you remember the whole thing with the, with the barley cakes um, and all that, which is the, at the time of the Passover. Um, and then the law at Sinai was in the Pentecost timing, not exactly at Pentecost, but it's in the third month. So none of those happened in the seventh month or specifically on the first day of the seventh month, right? Though there was a shofar sound of each of them, again, I don't find anything that ties a shofar with this day. Um, speak to the children of Israel, saying, the seventh month, and the first day of the month, have a Shabbaton, a memorial of alarm, a memorial of joyful noise. Or the Holman's uh, Bible translated this way, you're to have a day of complete rest, commemoration, and joyful shouting, a sacred assembly. So they translated uh, teru, uh, teru, uh, Zikron Terua as comm commemoration and joyful shouting. A Zikron Terua is a commemoration and joyful shouting. Now we see it's to be commemorated with trumpet blast, possibly. It's a memorial proclaimed with blast of trumpets, possibly. A reminder by, the, of, by blowing of trumpets. An alarm for a reminder. I mean, the, the true is to remind, remind you. So there's all kinds of possible interpretations of what this is about. Um, memorial or marking. So Leviticus 23 says, mark it with loud blasts on the trumpets, possibly. It is a day of blowing unto you, blowing the trumpets. Uh, as I said, this would tie in with remember the Sabbath day. It's it's not marked the Sabbath day, but it's the same word there. It's remembering or a day of memorial of remembrance. Right? Malachi 3.16, it brought me to this, to think of this then. Um, they that feared the Lord spoke often one to another, and the Lord heard, it, uh, hearkened and heard it, and a book of Zikron was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. So this is that other book we sometimes talk about was a book of remembrance, a book of Zikron uh, that's written for them. So I can, I can, sure, I can sit here and wax eloquent and try to s continue to sell you that shiny little object that they always give you about this is the day of the resurrection and return of Christ. And I can wax eloquent about that with various verses and try to make the case and make it sound really plausible. But the reality is these things don't necessarily tie to the day of trumpets. It's reading into the text something that's not there. All right? So the observance is only mentioned um, in a couple of um, texts. It's only mentioned 
It's not to say it wasn't being observed, but it's our only record of it being observed within Scripture is after the Babylonian captivity when they returned under Ezra and Nehemiah. So we'll take a look here in Ezra, chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 1. When the seventh month was come, today, the children of Israel were in the cities. The people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. So it's that they came together in unity, to be one body together at Jerusalem. Then stood up Yeshua, the son of Josadak, and his brethren, the priest, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren. And they built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. And they set the altar upon his basis, for fear was upon them because of the people of those countries. And they offered burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord, even burnt offerings morning and evening. So here's the start of the seventh month. They started to make offerings after the return from Babylonian captivity. They feared seeing uh, the people of those countries around about them, seeing themselves surrounded by armies, and they were seeking God's face uh, to bring him burnt offerings to seek his face. So says, then they kept also the Feast of Tabernacles as it is written and offered daily burnt offerings by number according to the custom as the duty of every day required. And afterward, they offered continual burnt offerings, both of the new moons and of all the set feasts unto the Lord that were consecrated. And if everyone that willingly offered a freewill offering unto the Lord, and from the first day of the seventh month, they began to do the burnt offerings unto the Lord, but the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. So they didn't have a temple built yet. And they already started to make the offerings because they built the altar and started to make offerings from this day after they're coming out of Babylon. Flipping over to Nehemiah, chapter 8. It says, All the people gathered themselves together as one man under the street that was before the water gate, and they spoke unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded the Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, all that can hear with understanding, upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until the midday, before the men and the women and those that can understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Oh, that we're the same today. And as for the scribe, stood upon a pulpit of wood, which was made for the purpose, and beside him stood uh, Matith, uh, Matithya, Shema, uh, Anaya, Uriah, Hilkiah, Maasiah, on his right hand, on his left hand, Padaya, Mishael, um, Melkia, Hashum, Hashpadana, Zachariah, or Zakaria, and Meshulam. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, because he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and they worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And also Yeshua, Bani, Serebya, Yamin, Akub, Shebetai, Hodiah, Maasya, Kalita, Azariah, Yozabad, Hanan, Palalia, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law. And the people stood in their place. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly, and they gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. So he stood up, he read, here's what the Torah says, here's what it means. And he expounded on it to explain, this is what this is what's just saying, this is what we're supposed to be doing. And Nehemiah, which is the Tershatha, uh, the, the governor, and Ezra, the priest, the scribe, and the Levites taught the people, said to the people, this day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. They were There's conviction. These people were attentive to know what does God want from us, and they heard it, and they were cut, knowing their transgressions before him. Yeah. All right. So this that's the only things we find there in the scriptures regarding uh, the festival, is that 
um, when they came back from Babylon, they built an altar that day, started ac uh, offering sacrifice that day. They brought the law back to the people that day, and the people were cut to the heart as they heard it. And they were told, this is not a day to mourn, it's a day to rejoice. Don't cry, don't weep. So again, tying Teruah more with a joy, a day, because it's a Yom Teruah, it's a day of joy, not a day of mourning. So the Teruah is not a mourning sound necessarily. Now, one of the things I want to address, I've addressed this in years past, I, I just uh, recently shared a, a Facebook note I wrote on this uh, before. A very popular idea being spread around today, um, that day and hour knoweth no man. Uh, people talk about this, this is out of the Olivet Discourse, which I was just teaching on, uh, and people tie this to this festival. So let, let's read these scriptures here. It's ex, uh, I'm sorry, Matthew 24, 36. Of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Matthew 25, 13. Watch therefore, you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man is coming. Mark 13, 32 to 33, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take heed, watch, and pray, for you know not what the time is. Now, what is often being said today is that that day and hour knoweth no man is a code phrase. It's an idiom meaning the Feast of Trumpets. Now, idioms, like we have them in English, and I gave some examples in my note, raining cats and dogs. Right? No one, yeah, no one steps in a poodle because it's raining cats and dogs. You step in a puddle, but not in a poodle, because it ain't literally cats and dogs falling from the sky out of the clouds. And so we'll say, oh no, no, this goes back to this thing with the thatch roof. Find me the evidence of that because I don't find it. I find this phrase rain cats and dogs even goes back to the time when everyone was having thatched roofs back in the 1600s and 1700s. I find this phrase being used. This idiom has been around for hundreds of years. And it wasn't about cats and dogs falling out of, out of your thatched roof. Right, it's a phrase that means it's raining heavily, and they would also use other animals besides cats and dogs in the older forms of the idiom. Okay, it cost me an arm and a leg. Most people don't come out of the store hopping or you know, looking like Anakin or something. Um, it just means that it is really high cost, yeah. Um, so we have plenty of idioms in English, and it's in a bunch of other languages. I'm sure you know idioms in German, right? And, and it's, well, Hebrew also does have idioms as other languages. But the claim is this is a Hebrew idiom, and if any Israelite heard this phrase, they would know, oh, he means the Day of Trumpets. Because all the festivals are, are based on the moon, and the month begins when the crescent sighted, and so when that crescent sighted, we can know, we can count 14 days or 15 days or whatever and know when the festivals are. But this is the only one that falls on the first day. So you don't know until the crescent sighted that it's there. No one knows. No one knows the day or the hour. And so this is that, that day. This is, this is what's argued. Okay. And it's a known Hebrew idiom. And I'll tell you, I, I can, if you need me to, I'll provo provide you quotes of people who are teaching this. I'm sure you know it without me having to provide it. I'm sure you've heard it, and you've maybe even shared the idea. I will tell you what's not biblical, and it's not historical. All right? So here's my, my call. According to what evidence is, is this a Hebrew idiom? Give me the quotes. Show me where this was. I'm telling you, mic drop. This... <laughs> There is no evidence that this is the Hebrew idiom. Search the right. There is a plethora of writings from the Jews. Right? Back from temple times and throughout the ages. Show me from those that this was a popular known Hebrew idiom. All right? Where is this taught in ancient Judaic sources? Is it in the Mishnah? No, it's not there. Remember, the Mishnah is the commentary on the Torah from 200 B.C. to 280. It's not there in the Mishnah. Is it in the Gemara, which is the commentary on the Mishnah? Nope, it's not there either. There's a whole tractate. That's those, the Mishnah and the Gemara make up the Talmud. There's a whole tractate or a whole scroll, a whole book called Tractate Rosh Hashanah, 
which is about this day, it's not in there either. <laughs> it's not in there. All right? Is it in the Targums, which is the Aramaic uh, dynamic translations, if I guess I put it that way, um, interpretations of the Torah and, and the writings? Nope, it's not there. Is it in Midrash? Nope, it's not there. How about Josephus? Did Matit and Yahoo? Uh, uh, did, did he do it? Nope. No, he didn't. How about Father Joseph Judeus? Nope, it's not there either. It's not in any primary ancient Judaic source. So all you have is charlatans today telling you it's a Hebrew idiom and telling you to send their $39.95 or whatever they want to charge you for their book or teaching. It is not biblical. It is not correct. It is not of the truth. All right? Search it. All right? What does the Scripture say? Mark 13. In those days after the tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. So how does this mark the day of trumpets? The sun is darkened, the moon doesn't give her light, and then you see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. How is that the day of trumpets? The day of trumpets is marked by the light of the sun upon the moon. Um, me thinks there's a problem with their interpretation, right? The stars of heaven shall fall, the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken, then shall the see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory, then shall he send his angels, shall gather his elect from the four winds, the uttermost part of the earth, the uttermost part of heaven. Learn a parable from the fig tree. When her branch is yet tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. Remember, we just went over this. I, the last time I was just up here speaking, we just went over the Olivet Discourse. What is the signs of his coming? Was it the moon phases? No. He says, I'm going to give you an example. Remember when the fig tree puts forth, you know that summer's near? How do you know when I'm coming? In like manner, when you see these things come to pass, what? When you see the sun go dark, the moon not give its light, that the stars go dark. When you see the wars and rumors of wars, you see nation against nation, you see all these things happening? That's the sign. It's not the crescent moon marking the day of trumpets that no one knows until it happens. Even contextually, it's not the case. He's saying, what's going to mark it? Truly I say unto you, uh, when you see these things have to pass, no, it's not even at the doors. Truly I say unto you that this generation will not pass till these things be done. Heaven and earth shall pass away, my word shall not pass away. Of that day and hour knows no man. No, not the angels which are in heaven, nor the sun, but the Father. What you say? Take heed, watch and pray, for you don't know when the time is. Who's he talking to? He's talking to his apostles. Remember he went up, he was in the, at this point, he was going back and forth from the temple to the Mount of Olives every night. And he went up privately with his disciples on the Mount of Olives, and he's talking to them. He says, you don't know the day of the hour. What do you mean, Jesus? I'm a Hebrew. I understand the idiom. You said no man knows the day. I know one of this. What do you mean I don't know the time? You just told me it's a day of trumpets. Right? No, that's not what happened. He just said, you don't know when this is. You better watch and pray. So he wasn't like, wink, wink, get it. I'm, talking, I'm giving you a hint here. I've seen one teacher say, oh, you know, it's like, it's like, well, I don't know when I'm coming back, but gobble, gobble. You know, like, giving, oh, you would know he's coming back on Thanksgiving. And that's what, what he's doing. No, that's not what he's doing. Take heed and watch and pray. You don't know what the time is. Then he goes again, look, the Son of Man is, is like a man taking a far journey. He left his house, gave authority to his servants, to every man his work, commanded the, the port of the watch. You watch. You don't know when the master of the house is coming. Who's he talking to again? He's talking to the apostles. He's talking to his people. They don't know. He didn't give us a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Here it is. That's not what it means, right? 
I say unto you all, watch. And again, Matthew 24. Of that day and hour knows no man, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only, is that as the days of Noah were, so also should the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and they knew not until the flood came and took them all the way. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. It's going to come with a quickness. There wasn't like the weather forecaster saying, there's a, a strict flood coming in from here to here. Oh, everywhere. And it's going to be here starting tomorrow at 3 p.m. No, they didn't know. They lived ignorantly. They didn't know the signs of the times. Yes. And again, how many times did he talk about there being like a thief in the night? I'm going to come at a time you don't know. Over and over and over, he said so. Over and over and over. Watch therefore, for you don't know what hour your Lord does come. Know this, if the good men of the house had known in which watch the thief would come, he would have watched. He would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, you also be ready for such an hour as you think not the Son of Man is coming. Because the thieves only come on the day of, of trumpets. So we know one of this because, no. It's, he's saying they don't know. In an hour when you think, it, think it's not going to happen, he's going to come. And this, he continues, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he is not looking for him, in an hour when he is not aware, he shall cut him a thong. Who is he talking about? He's talking about his people. He said, you better be watching yourselves and don't fall astray and don't start beating on your fellow bre uh, brethren because I'm going to come and I'm going to cut you up asunder and appoint you your portion with the hypocrites. He's saying, you're coming, uh, I'm coming at a time. You don't know when this is. You don't know when I'm coming. And he continues throughout Matthew 25. All different things about where the, the Lord delaying his coming and what's going to happen. You don't know when. So what is, no man knows the day or hour? No man knows the day or hour. That's what it means. Surprise. That's what it means. All right. Numbers 10, <laughs> the silver trumpets. Here's where we come to the horns that are blown on the first day of every month and on every festival. Okay, This is why I, I say that they need to stop and just get beyond the English and realize that trumpets aren't only blown at the Feast of Trumpets. It's every feast has trumpets. Every new moon has trumpets. All the sacrifices, they will load trumpets over the sacrifice. So we see here in Numbers 10, Make you two trumpets of silver, of a whole piece you shall make them, that you may use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeying of the camps. Okay? Now, that's interesting. We find that there's trumpets being used for calling the assembly because that's some of the things that we read about, like in the Olivet Prophecy. Then after the tribulation of those days, the, the sun will go dark, the moon will turn to blood, the... Well, um, the stars won't give its light. You'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with his angels, with the sound of a trump, to gather his elect, right? So it's a calling of the assembly, like being called to assemble together. All right, and this with the sound of a trumpet. Well, let's continue in the text and see what it says. So when they shall blow the ka with them, uh, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to you at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And if they blow taka with one trumpet, and the reason I'm showing the taka that this is not terua or rua here, this is just simply the word for blowing into the trumpet, taka, to sound the trumpet. If they taka with one trumpet, then the princes, which are the heads of the thousands of Israel, shall gather themselves to you. But when you taka a terua, when you blow an alarm, then the camps that are on the east parts shall go forward. And when you taka a terua the second time, the camps that lie on the south side shall take your journey. And when you blow a terua for the, uh, they shall blow a for their for their journeys. But when the congregation is to be gathered together, you shall taka, but you do not sound an alarm, a rua. So when it's time to gather the congregation together, do not sound a terua or a rua. 
And the sons of Aaron, the priests, shall taka with the trumpets, and they shall be to you for an ordinance forever throughout your generations. And if you go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresses you, you shall taka a ruah with the trumpets, and you will be zakard before the Lord your God. And you shall be saved from your enemy. So I find it interesting here in Numbers 10 that we find both Teruah and Zakar tied in uh, together, much like we find like with uh, with Numbers and uh, uh, Leviticus, with the, the Day of Remembrance. So they say when you're surrounded by your enemies, you sound a ruah and you will be Zakar. Okay? So what we have here, oh, I mean, a couple of, things on trumpets of war. Numbers 31, uh, 67, Moses sent them to war, a thousand of every tribe, then with Phineas, the son of Eleazar, a priest, to the war with the holy instruments, so this is the silver trumpets, they went out, and the trumpets to blow in his hand, and they warred against the Midianites as the Lord commanded Moses, and they slew all the males. So this is an example of them following what was decreed in Numbers 10, that they went off with the trumpets, even in time of war, that for God to be on their side against their enemies, for them to be remembered. Um, the shofar, teruah, and war are tied together in verses such as these. When you hear the sound of the shofar, all the people shall ruah with a great ruah. That's, again, that was back at the, the walls of Jericho coming down. Um, Job 39, 25, the, uh, he, the horse, says amongst the shofar, ha, ha, he smells the battle far off and the thunder of the captains and the teruah. So this is the horse as, as the horse riding in the war. Um, and we see here the, the shouting and the shofar ties in with the time of a battle and war. Jeremiah 4.19, you have heard, O my soul, the sound of the shofar and the uh, alarm of war, to rule of war. Joel 2.1, blow you the shofar in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming. It's near at hand. In Zeph uh, Zephaniah 116, a day of the shofar and teruah against the fenced cities and against the high towers. Okay, now does this anywhere in these verses, though it mentions teruah and shofar, does any of them tie to say this is talking about the first day of the seventh month? No, there's nothing that says that. There's anything that says that you're to blow a shofar on the first day of the seventh month. No, it doesn't. Okay, so be careful again what we read, that we're not reading into a text something that is not there. So in Numbers 10.10, 10, we saw, uh, we see that, that these two silver trumpets were to be used in the days of gladness and in your solemn days and the beginnings of your months, like today, that you took with the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, that they may be to you for a zikron before your God, I am the Lord your God. So again, these silver trumpets were blown every festival and every new moon, okay? Now what we're seeing is, as we're reading through Numbers 10, is that one trumpet was used to assemble the elders of Israel, two trumpets were used to assemble the whole congregation. Alarm blasts were sounded to begin the journeys, alarm blasts were sounded in times of war. At the feast, the Sabbath, the new moons, the, um, but it doesn't, they were to sound these trumpets, but the scripture doesn't indicate what the taka is. Is it an alarm or teruah? What, what is the sound with that? It doesn't say. It just says you taka. Doesn't, so considering the rest of the scripture, I, I know it says you taka, a teruah on other ones, but other ones you just say you taka. So I think the ones that say you taka, you're not teruah-ing, excuse the Hebrewish. Um, but it, yeah, if, it's, if it includes teruah, then that's how you're taka-ing. If it doesn't have teruah, you're just takain without a teruah. No, no teruah. Especially when it says you don't teruah. Yes, it's a mixture of Hebrew and English, so it's Hebrewish. So, <laughs> all right. So as it is said out of Numbers, uh, I'm sorry, out of Matthew 24, we see that he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds. So when you gather together the elect, according to the law, according to the law that was given on the Moses, what sound did they make? What was the great sound of the trumpet? Numbers 10, 7 said, when the congregation is to be gathered together, you shall blow, but you do not sound an alarm. 
The ESV says you shall blow a long blast, but you will not sound an alarm. And that again is ruah, teruah. So when I consider that, I would say that this day, Yom Teruah, which is a day of alarm, does not match with the concept of what the sound of the trumpets is when the angels gather us together at his return. Because when you gather together, you do not sound a teruah. Right? So it would seem that interpretation is against what is laid out in Numbers 10, which was part of us understanding how things work in the spiritual realm as well as physically for the nation of Israel. True trumpets were used to assemble the whole congregation, but it was not to be an alarm, not to be a teruah. Okay. Um, before I hit into this, another aspect that I've always considered with this as well is that this day is not part of the harvest festival. A lot of the, fest a lot of the festivals are tied with the harvest, like Passover has the barley harvest with the first fruits offering. Pentecost is the first fruits of the wheat. You have the grapes and the fruits of Sukkot, of tabernacles. Uh, this is not a harvest festival. And I find harvest is reference to resurrection within the scripture. Like the harvest of the barley, of the first fruits, was a picture of the resurrection of Christ. The harvest, like I said, of the sheaf uh, or the, the, the wheat is with the presentation on Pentecost is a picture of the resurrection of the saints. Um, this is not a harvest festival, and I don't find it typifying our resurrection in that sense then uh, either. Now, I was delighted to actually run across um, a couple of quotes here from Matthew Henry, um, because this is one of the Protestants who do not take the interpretation that is the standard thing presented today, but he understands the festivals here in this way. He says, The blowing of trumpets represents the preaching of the gospel by which men are called to repent of sin and to accept the salvation of Christ, which is signified by the Day of Atonement. It also invites us to rejoice in God and to become strangers and pilgrims on earth, which is denoted by the Feast of Tabernacles, observed in the same month. So this day represents the preaching of the gospel. So it's the warning, but also joyful, good news. It's the good news that's being preached, the gospel. Men to our, repent of sin to accept the salvation of Christ, signified by the Day of Atonement, that he is our high priest, as well as the goats that were sacrificed and the goat that lived, who sits on the Father's right hand as our intercessor. And we were called then to be strangers and pilgrims on earth to uh, uh, travel in this wilderness while we're awaiting uh, his kingdom. As we were redeemed, as they were redeemed out of Egypt, out of bondage, we're redeemed out of bondage and we're being brought into the promised land. And we're to be traveling uh, and being holy people throughout this time. Uh he further said, they were called by the sound of trumpet to shake off spiritual drowsiness, to search and to try their ways and to amend them. The Day of Atonement was the ninth day after this. He's counting exclusively. So he falls a little bit biblically. Uh, the Day of Atonement was the ninth day after this. Thus, they were awakened to prepare for that day by sincere and serious repentance that it might de indeed be to them a day of at one mint of atonement. The humbling of our souls for sin and the making of our peace with God is work that requires the whole man in the closest application of mind. In another commentary, uh, Matthew Henry, it said, these trumpets signify the preached gospel. It sounds an alarm to sinners. It calls them to repent. It proclaims liberty to the captives and the slaves of Satan. It collects the worshipers of God because he's going to like the numbers 10, what the trumpets do, right? It directs and encourages their heavenly journey. It stirs them up to combat against the world and sin and encourages them with the assurance of victory. It leads their attention to the sacrifice of Christ 
and shows the Lord's presence for their protection. It is also necessary that the gospel trumpet gives a distinct sound according to the persons addressed or to the end proposed, whether to convince, to humble, to console, to exhort, to reprove, or to teach. Amen. There's, there's some good meat here from Mr. Henry, from Brother Matt. Uh, there's good, good expounding on, on Numbers 10 and understanding it in a spiritual sense. I mean, if you really realize what this is saying, you know, again, there, there's some great encouragement in this. You know, the thing about these things, you know, a direction encourages your heavenly journey on, on our way as we're going. Because remember, he led them and led them in battle, led them to the wilderness, led them to the promised land to be with them and, and keep them. It stirs us up to combat against the world. And this part here, it encourages our assurance of victory because he says, when you got the enemy surrounding you, you sound and you will be remembered and the Lord will fight for you and protect you. We have assurance of victory in Christ. Let the trumpets <laughs> remind you. Cry out. You will be heard. You are his. All right. I titled this The Sound into All the Earth. And it's here out of Romans 10, which Paul built upon Psalm 19. Their sound went into all the earth and their words to the end of the world. And he's talking about the, the gospel going out, the good word of God. Jesus had said, we're to go into all the world, he told the apostles. And he told them as they make disciples to teach them to do all things that he had told them to do. And that is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Because everyone around you needs the bridge. Every one of us needs the atonement of Christ. No one is connected to the Father without the Son. No one has covering for their sin. Otherwise, you're just part of this earth that's going to be burnt up. That's going to be destroyed. Jesus says that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Yes, we already put the trumpet to our lips. Right? Romans 10, 15 says, It is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. I know I've often spoken about the gospel and our need to have it, and I hope that my preaching on it doesn't come apart where it's just making you dull. But I'm hoping it, it lights a fire under you to have a heart for the people without knowing their end. If you saw your neighbor's house on fire right now, would you just stand by? Or would you do something to try to rescue them from the fire? Guess what? Your neighbor's house is on fire. Everyone you know who was not in Christ Jesus, their house is on fire. And they may be oblivious to it. They might be asleep in the house, eyes closed to the fact that their house is burning, but their house is burning. How beautiful if you'd walk your feet over there and bring them the gospel of peace. If you put the trumpet to your lips, give them warning. Give them tidings of great joy. As you cry aloud, you spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Show the people their transgressions. All right. The signal of the trumpet, is, Matthew Henry said it has to be clear. As Paul said, if the trumpet sounds on an uncertain sound, people aren't going to know what to do how they know to prepare for the battle or what they're going to do. The signal of the trumpet is clear. It's preached by all the prophets, preached by Jesus Christ himself. Repent. Turn to God that your sins might be wiped out. And the times of refreshing may come from the Lord. So happy day of trumpets, brothers, sisters. Put the trumpets to your lips.
with trumpets to your lips, liberty to the captive, immortality to the dying, pardon to the condemned, salvation to the lost. Share the good news, all. God bless and keep you.